Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, hope everyone's uh, staying safe and well. And uh, welcome to uh, the latest Here for Business webinar that we are uh, presenting on behalf of the growth company. I have some illustrious guests with me today who hopefully I'm going to introduce and they're going to introduce themselves shortly. But today's theme is around change leadership. And we've entitled it staying ahead of the curve. So don't be surprised when you see a curve coming up that we can discuss in more detail. And one of the things that uh, has resonated with me, particularly through the pandemic, is a guy who I think is a little bit smarter than I am, um, and that's Albert Einstein. And he coined the phrase, this, this phrase was coined in the 50s. And he said, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. And when I think back, uh, Albert Einstein lived through two world wars, a major Sp Spanish flu pandemic, and the Great Depression of the 30s. So if anyone's in a good position to uh, make a comment of that nature, this guy is it, because he's lived through some pretty dramatic changes. And it's one that I've used consistently in webinars that I've delivered, uh, both in the growth company and beyond, to remind people that we've been here before. And despite the depth of despair that sometimes we get into in organisations, we always seem to find a way of coming out the other side. So uh, with that in mind, we've created this theme for people to take some practical takeaways back into their organization that they can use on a personal level and deliver on behalf of the people they represent in their businesses. So remember that uh, phrase, in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. So let's look at the opportunities that are available to us as leaders to manage these changes. I'm joined today uh, by three colleagues who are going to uh, navigate uh, this theme. Uh, Jan Scott, Director of Matchbox Associates, Catherine Shuttleworth, Managing Director of the Parently Group, and Dennis Treacy, the CEO of Culture Compass. And rather than me try to, to introduce them, I'm going to give them an opportunity now to uh, to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start um, at the top with Jan. Jan, would you mind introducing yourself to, to our audience today and explain um, what you do and how you do it? Sure. Morning. Morning, everybody. Morning, Paul. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so Matchbox Associates has been around since the beginning of 2014. Um, we are a business consultancy organization that works with SMEs in the Northwest. And um, predominantly, we're supporting leaders and their leadership teams in a broad range of initiatives that include coaching, training and mentoring support that allows them to progress the development of their business and the growth of their business uh, more quickly. Um, we've enjoyed a long relationship with the Growth Hub and many of the other organizations in the Northwest for a number of years. Uh, and today we've worked with, I think we're just approaching just over 700 companies now since 2014. So we've got plenty of experience of uh, large and small organizations within that definition of SMEs. And we've also worked with a very broad range of clients, including service industries and product manufacturers. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, much appreciated. And next on my list is, is Catherine. Catherine, do, do introduce yourself uh, and explain a little bit more about uh, the Parently Group. Okay, thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Catherine Shuttleworth. I'm Managing Director of the Parently Group. We're based in Ardwick in Manchester. And we make conscious kids wear for school, sport and adventure for young kids. Um, under three different brands. We're probably best known for our David Luke school uniform brand, um, supplying thousands of schools in the UK from academies to the very bespoke uniform of Eton and Harrow. Uh, for the last 12 years, we've been on a, a really big sustainability journey to 
lead our market in supplying school uniforms that are made from recycled plastic bottles. And this year we've launched the first fully recyclable circular blazer. Uh, we've got a culture with really strong values to have a positive impact on all our people, our customers and, and the world around us, however we can. Um, and we aim to develop this ethos through all our business activities. I've, I've led the business since 2014 um worked extensively with the growth hub actually during that time and i think i'll be able to offer some practical examples um of managing change during the the challenging times we've all been leading through since since then really um, and no doubt i'll get some good advice from the experts here on maybe how i could have done things differently <laughs> thank you catherine uh, and last but uh, definitely by no means least, Dennis, um, from Culture Compass. Um, if you can introduce yourself and explain what Culture Compass actually is all about. I oh, will. Thank you, Paul. Good morning and good morning, everybody. Yeah, I've been the chief executive, well, I'm the uh, founder of Culture Compass, but I've only been uh, doing that for a couple of three years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 40 years in global food supply chains. So I started off like Albert as a scientist and ended up in uh, leadership. So I've got 30 years of leadership in um, a global food manufacturing business across you know, 13 countries and managing challenges and changes and evolutions across 13 different time zones, languages, belief systems, etc. So I use that experience now to energize performance uh, in either individuals through mentoring and coaching uh, managing directors, chief executives, anybody else uh, who needs it, through the organisational culture of a business, because I passionately believe my experience is that you know good culture in business uh, can unlock you know real potential, and also in global supply chains, it's my experience so I can reduce defects, improve performance uh, in any aspect of a global supply chain. So I share that my knowledge uh, with uh, growth cover from that point of view. So hopefully I'll share some of that today. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. And, and thanks everyone for uh, helping us support uh, this particular uh, webinar uh, that's to follow. And for everyone who's um, joined us today, just to let you know that I have included a slide at the end of the deck, which has a brief bio um, for Jan, Catherine and Dennis. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about them, then do reach out to them via their normal um, social media network. But I have put some notes into the slide deck at the end for you to, uh, to discover a little bit more about each of our individual speakers today. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we do want the session to be as interactive and informative as we can possibly make it. So with that in mind, um, if you've never used uh, this particular portal uh, before, if you look into the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you will have um, a couple of functions which um, are, are really interesting. Uh, one is the chat function, and you can use that as, as you would normally do. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams. You can uh, chat with the moderators, with the speakers through that function. Uh, but more importantly, I'd like to draw your attention to the questions. Uh, and there's a great opportunity here where we're going to be sharing some thoughts around change um, and particularly, as I mentioned earlier, staying ahead of the curve. Um, if that initiates some thoughts in your own mind, it's a great opportunity to ask our speakers some questions. So if you click in the question box, um, post your question, then that will appear for me to pass on to the, the relevant speakers. And, and as I say, we do want it to be as interactive and interesting as possible. So if you've got a question that's burning away, I'm sure other members of the audience will be feeling, feeling in a similar way. Don't hold back ask the question and we'll uh, pass it on to our panel. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so Jan, um, please talk about the curve that we need to uh, be aware of. 
Yes, yeah, so um, I thought we'd just kick off this morning um, focusing on change, change management, organizational change, lots of descriptions about change. But by looking at a model designed by this gentleman, William Bridges, I think um, the timing of this model came into play predominantly towards the end of the 90s, beginning of the noughties. And it's quite a nice, simple model, which is why I tend to, to refer to it when I'm talking to clients in these types of situations. And what it's really depicting is a three-phased approach to looking at how change takes place in organizations and also being aware of some of the things that are going on during that process of change. So you can see here that we've got a phase that's titled ending on the left-hand side. Um, we've got a transition uh, phase in the middle. And then on the right, we've got the new beginnings phase. As you can probably imagine, what we're describing here is moving from the left-hand side across to the right-hand side when we're describing those change activities within an organization. Um, and within each of these, we've got a primary focus. So you can see in the ending phase, we're talking about reconciliation, recognizing what's about to end. As we move into that central phase, we're talking about the reorganization, the reorientation of individuals and organizations as they begin to start the new beginnings with a sense of new commitment and a new way forward. So I just wanted to look at each of these individual phases quickly, uh, talk about a couple of simple observations that take place during this phase, and then give um, some connection in terms of things that leaders might want to consider or think about with regards to their roles at those timings. Um, so we're going to start with the ending phase. You'll see that there is a dashed line that moves across this whole model that talks about productivity. So if we're really engaging in this first ending phase as it's described, it's where we're really looking at how people are about to transition from what we call the past to gradually accepting the new beginnings or the new ways forward. Um, and it's at this point where people start to assess essentially what they're likely to lose in this phase um, and what they'll be keeping with them. And initially, as you probably come across this, most businesses have faced this at some point already in their lives, that we begin on these curves, typically uh, still with reasonable productivity taking place, but there's an immediate response from individuals that ranges in complexity of emotions from initial denial, can this be happening, through to a more immediate settling emotions of anxiety, anticipating what does this all mean? How can we cope? How can I cope? And then eventually we start to move into some more significant emotions of shock. And then eventually, um, as we start to move into the fear phase and the anger phase and frustration phase, this is where we start to recognize that essentially productivity is now beginning to wane as people are facing some of the truths and realities of the situations that they face. And we begin to move into this transition phase that centrally positions where a great deal of emotions take place. So in that initial ending phase, there's a lot, I think Paul mentioned, you know, one of the emotions that comes through in the middle of this can include things like loneliness, uh, sadness. There's also sort of resistance to the process and, and maybe little bits of depression there as well also fix in. So a really key element for leaders to be thinking about in terms of their role and how they approach these situations is first of all, make sure that you're showing empathy. Um, you know, the, there's nothing worse than leaders in organizations who are trying to be very, very strong in character, but they're just not at all empathetic. They're not sympathetic to the circumstances that are around them. So being able to connect with people right at this phase is, is critically important. Um, and also important with demonstrating that empathy is the effective communication that you actually utilize during this phase. Again, it's really, really key to the success of um, navigating this pathway smoothly and, success and successfully. So you want to be thinking about communicating clearly and transparently what's the purpose and the extent of this change likely to be, the advantages of the change, um, but also starting to recognize and share amongst your colleagues 
what the employee skill sets might be required as we move into towards these new beginnings. So by the end of that transition, we're moving into this transitional phase right in the center section here. Um, also, it's often referred to as the neutral zone, by the way. So if you do go away and want to look up this William Bridges model, you may see it also referred to as the neutral zone. And the observation primarily here is that clearly this is the area which bridges the gap between the end of a situation and the beginning of a new phase. So people in this are atypically beginning to understand and learn how to control their emotions. And you can see this sort of diagram here. It's a little bit like a sort of washing machine. There's lots and lots of feelings and uh, emotions taking place here. And at the bottom, it talks about reorientation. Well, that's exactly what's happening. People are beginning to switch away from where they've just come from in the ending phase and now starting to come to grips with moving towards the new beginnings. So in this phase, um, there's a lot of discovery taking place. It's about people finding a new identity. Um, so it, essentially the leader's role here is initially is to allow some time for these emotions to settle. Um, we've got to give employees the space to experience, but also to allow them to encourage new ways of doing things. Um, it's important, as you can see, as we're moving into this final phase, that we really want to get all feelings like scepticism um, and avoidance of the new beginnings. We want to have those fully, fully cleared out so that when we move into this final stage, everybody's on board. They might not like it, but they understand exactly what's going to take place and they're prepared and ready to endure it. But the final observation really on this section is, is, is right in this neutral zone is where you're likely to have the lowest level of performance in the business. Because we've got all these emotions moving around, because we've got a, a mixture of capabilities, some people will adapt to change more quickly than others. So at some point in this process, you'll see people moving quite quickly to the new beginnings phase. Others may take a little bit longer to do that. Um, so it's again important that where as a leader we're communicating with people we're providing honest feedback about the new realities and about those organizational changes and then finally we're moving into this last phase the new beginnings phase and this is where we're encouraging and we're seeing employees starting to embrace change and sort of successfully move into uh, new ways of working so with that comes an invigorated enthusiasm and an improved productivity. You can see the curve really starts to move quite quickly um, where we start to see people embracing other emotions. We've got things to do with the hope and enthusiasm, looking forward to what, what might the future hold. Um, but this willingness to contribute to the change is key to making this phase of the process work smoothly and quickly. So we want to carry as many of uh, the employees through that positive phase as we possibly can. So a way that we can do that as a leader is recognizing and appreciating the hard work of everybody that's been involved. So celebration is a key part of this phase for leaders. I think one of the things that I've talked to business owners about is we really don't do celebration quite enough when we've been through these processes of change. Um, so put, put some thoughts aside as to how you might go about that and congratulate those who have put their hard work and effort into making this change a reality. Um, but it's also an opportunity to be able to reflect on the whole transition process, talk about some of the lessons learned, use some of those lessons to put them into future development and training for people in the future in the business. Um, but a final thought, of course, are for those ones who have been struggling most with this whole process, so one of the things that's important for the leader to do is to continue, even after the change has been embedded, to support those who may still have uh, or may still be struggling a little bit with some of this change and the process. Perhaps for some of them, it's been a difficult journey they've got there. Um, and it's very useful if, again, we've got the human side of leadership coming into play here, just ensuring that we're encouraging those individuals um, to continue to do good work uh, and making sure that they don't feel left behind. So, Paul, that's really what I want you to just briefly go through. Um, if you want to pass that through to any questions, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, really, really interesting, Jan, and, and um, really great to see this from a from a person's journey. Uh, I think that's important. 
and recognising that this is going on within everyone um, in the workforce is significant. Uh, I think up until recently, there were two things that were guaranteed in life, and that was death and taxes. Um, I think there's an, another one now, and that's change. Um, it's happening around us. It's happening all the time. Um, but one of the words that's emerged through that, that change program is the idea of, of being resilient, being able to manage and cope with this type of change. If it's constantly occurring, uh, yes, we can practice it. Yes, it becomes a little bit habitual. But constantly going through this pro process can really create demands on our own emotions. So as, as leaders, do you have any examples of, of uh, type of resilience uh, qualities you'd expect uh, the leaders who are trying to drive these changes to, to actually have? Uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, I think th there are some obvious things, aren't there? I guess that we're probably all aware of. So things like you know, good communication and and being uh, a motivator and an inspirer to people. Um, also having the skills to make sure that you can prioritize. You know, there's a lot of things going on. Making good decisions about what do we move on first. Um, showing clear direction. So these sort of navigating skills. But um, sort of aside from some of those more typical, what I'd call skills, in terms of qualities, I think I just want to pick up on on three that I sort of I talk about a little bit. Um, one of them is actually a very Americanism, um, and it's referred to as sort of showing up. So by this, I mean really making sure that the leader has that personal energy. Um, you know, this is a difficult time, and it's one of the few times that we sort of might want to have that slight Winston Churchill moment where we feel as though we're leading from the front and we're giving a sense of direction. Um, but it's very much about, you know, demonstrating that we're giving of our best, both as individuals, but for others around us. So I think that's, you know, atypically one of the characteristics that I think are important in terms of quality of, of leadership and resilience. I think that also leads nicely into another one, which is the, the, the quality of taking charge. You know, we're going to demonstrate that we understand the situations that we're confronting adversity we're confronting reality but also being transparent in that process too so i think taking charge is something that's key to success in good leadership during these difficult times and then finally um, there's also this ensuring that we've got this sense of purpose about everything that we do um, you'll probably will be talking i expect no doubt about this is also a great time for opportunity so it's about seeking opportunity in these difficult times there's a great many business out there who will tell you a story of how not only have they been able to be resilient through difficult times but they've actually seeked and sought opportunities during that turbulence and actually come from that process and found different ways of working different business models to employ uh, different activities to be carrying out and it's actually transformed the business in many ways um, so again this seeking sense of purpose the sort of pursuit of the why if you like yeah fantastic and really really great tips that showing up um uh, taking charge and having that sense of purpose, three key uh, points of leadership, um, and in particular, very, very useful when we're, we're trying to manage change in our organisations. Uh, Catherine, can I, can I bring you in here? And can you sort of um, expand on, on what Jan said and, and maybe put that into context of how you um, manage your own resilience during these periods of change? And, and what do you seek in terms of support and help from those around you? Because you can't do this on your own. Um, so um, can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, well, it's really great seeing Jan's uh, model there, which I haven't ever used in uh, implementation, but it's, I think, instinctively, I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, leaders and business people who, who would recognise this cycle that we go through. And, um, I think it's really easy to point to periods in the pandemic when we look back now and possibly people have a bit of fatigue with those kinds of examples because we did all go through that at the same time. I think one that I think about um, that, you know, may start to become relevant for this period we're going into is um, a few years back prior to the pandemic, losing a huge contract that we'd had for 28 years in the business. Um, and the 
um, emotional journey that, that I went on uh, that I think actually provided quite a lot of good kind of uh, muscle memory for later occasions. But just how this cycle absolutely came into play, and, and I did speak to people at the time who, who spoke about almost like the grief cycle, and it's very similar what, what you're talking about there. Um, and I think that, again, with what Jan talks about in terms of those qualities that you need to show, and I think, again, just instinctively where uh, I, I would say that, you know, it's very similar to showing up, visibility was so important to make sure that I was sharing with everyone, this is the situation, I couldn't hide things from people, there's such an in, a, a tendency, I think, to avoid those very difficult uh, confrontations with what's happening. Um, and so that denial kicks in where you might say, I'll just avoid actually talking about this, but being very visible with the team internally with what that means for the business. Um, and I think also uh, being quite open about the vulnerability, I would say is, is something that, um, you know, that in feeling the fear, actually telling people that that uh, this is not easy for us as a business and we all have to find the ways together. Um, it, I think that then to come out of that, the third one I would say after that, showing that vulnerability is, is actually having confidence and showing everyone that you've got that confidence. So that's quite, again, similar to what Jan's talking about in terms of that taking charge. I think that as much as people, um, in, in the way we lead now need to see that we are not bulletproof that we also have you know empathy and emotions for the, the difficulties that everyone's going through and share those that actually we have the confidence to uh, find new ways find solutions find different ways that will move out of the problem and i think with the example i had where um you know we'd lost a major contract um, I went really, when I look at this model, I went really quickly up into energy and enthusiasm and, and pivoting into a new product category. Um, and I think that probably did that too quickly and then found myself sliding back down again and, and didn't manage the pace very well with everyone else in the organisation. And I think that's when the communication has to kick in as being so vital to make sure that everyone is on that journey along the way because I was saying don't worry we can take all of this on we can do this instead um and i think that there was definitely a pace issue on that curve where i'd i'd jumped out of it before i was ready i don't know yeah. that's something you've seen before jan exactly yes and i think you know one of the, the characteristics that, that that business leaders have to contemplate a lot is that you know the speed at which change takes place because you can have this very disruptive effect. You can have, you know, really fantastic opportunities. But as you as you mentioned there, Catherine, it's really important that you know the people in the business follow you through at the right pace. Otherwise, it can be very disruptive. You sort of get this sense of pulling the business apart slightly or leaving people behind, which can you know be equally as bad. So absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. Much appreciated. I want you to hold that thought you you mentioned around communication because we've got some questions coming in uh, with regards to uh, communicating with your people, with your teams, with your organisation as a whole, and perhaps some of the other stakeholders uh, that come into play here. Um, but that leads me nicely into to understanding what the dynamics of all this. Um, how you build a foundation around um, the dynamics uh, associated with these programs and introduce you to uh, to Dennis again. So, Dennis, um, tell me all about uh, energies and predictable and repeatable outcomes. What What's this all about? Okay, the first thing I'll do is just uh, uh, bring you a quote from uh, somebody I uh, follow at uh, well. A, a Greek philosopher called Heraclitus, who said there's nothing more permanent than change. What he also said was a person uh, never steps in the same river twice because it's never the same river and, he, and, it, and that he's never the same person. And I think if you, if you accept the fact that change is inevitable, change is continuous and we evolve continuously, if you can reduce the 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 shock and awe that, that, that Jan described around change and just make change an everyday occurrence, then suddenly you move from being reactive to agile. And I think that's absolutely fundamental for a business. 
And I think Catherine ex used a, a, her example very, very well there. So my 40 years, just back to this first slide, my 40 years, Paul, has led me to the absolute fact for my point, my, my fact and my reality. And there are four, there are four elements uh, that need to be considered to ensure that any business, any organization, any activity is repeatable and predictable because what we are what we're after in life is repeatability and predictability. We're creatures of habit. We want to know what's going to happen. We want to know what the outcomes are going to be. And this model for me is the, uh, the culmination of my experience there because my life has been spent managing risk, predicting things, and ensuring that my business remains competitive, remains ahead of the pack because we were doing battles with huge multinational conglomerates. We couldn't afford not to let our, to take our after ball. So for me, you know, keeping in balance these four critical elements of strategy, performance, organization, and culture is critical to ensuring that you can manage a repeatable and predictable outcome, whatever your organization is. Doesn't matter what it is. Could be a religious group, could be a production company, it could be somebody that makes something. Uh, and I, I've put some examples in there of what strategy is, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read them out for you, but it's where a, dis, a business decides what it's going to do, decides what adventure it's going to uh, take on, decides how much it's going to invest in all the elements of its, uh, of its adventure. Performance is about understanding how you're going to measure what success is, because if you're confused about what's good, or if you're confused about what, what performance or success is, or indeed failure is, then you're, you're not going to be measuring the right thing, you're not going to be looking at the right data, and you're going to be surprised by uh, things that happen. So, you know, uh, uh, Catherine talked about suddenly losing the contract that she'd had for 28 years, uh, for, for, sorry, for a period of time. So it's, it's understanding obviously how that, uh, that could have happened. And, and uh, as she said, going back through the loop and, and recognizing uh, what changed and how, how you can become more agile. The other element is organization. You've got to have the right structure, the communication plans. You've got to know uh, what your competencies are, where your resources are applied and how much, I mean, you can have great resources, great competencies, but if you, if you overload them, then you've got a capacity issue. You've also got maturity in your organisation. If you're all new and you're all uh, excited and you're all got, you've, you've all got your yellow energy, then you're not perhaps going to be planning as well as you should. And then the final bit is how people interact, relationships within businesses and organisations, what the values are, you know, um, how people interact with each other, what behaviours are acceptable, uh, what's described as good conduct and where, more, most importantly, where accountability sits. Not just, not just who's responsible for something, but who's actually accountable for it. So that's my, my first model, if you like, an, ex an example. I've got another slide that I'd like to share. Okay, so this is focusing particularly on culture now. You know, again, Using culture to change fortune or to change performance is, has been, uh, kind of, I suppose, my life for the last uh, 20 years. And recognizing that there are different phases of culture in an organization. I used, I, what I did was I adapted the DuPont Bradley curve, which talks about safety, particularly about safety, how to, how to keep people safe. And in a reactive culture, people, uh, keep themselves safe because they're quick and agile and they can jump out of the way of a fast moving forklift truck if there's no control or structure. That's the same for uh, uh, product quality. That's also the same for an organization which wants to be repeatable and predictable. So if you're in a reactive culture where people respond to events, they may respond very, very well, but at some point you're going to be surprised. If you look at the next phase, which is a, a, a dependent culture or supervised culture, that's where rules and systems and plans and structure is in place. So as long as the rules are obeyed, people will be safe or the business will, will, will respond and react as it should do. But again, as soon as you take that, that hierarchy or that supervision out of the way, if you imagine that you know we stopped uh, employing uh, parking uh, meter monitors, then people would suddenly start to park on double yellow lines, lines again. 
It's that, that simple analogy. Then we move further into inter independent culture where certain people within an organization will always do the right thing. So as a result of that, you've got a much better chance of, of being repeatable and predictable, and you can actually set it there as a goal, as an objective. Uh, and the final bit, which is uh, where everyone wants to be, is interdependency, where every person within your organization uh, feels part of the organization, feels responsible for the outcomes, and absolutely will do everything they can. You know, you know, you, you know those kinds of people. They're always there first in the morning. They're always there uh, last thing at night. They won't, they won't clock off at half past five if they're still on a the call. They'll keep going, uh, and they'll take personal pride in what they do in an organization. And that's where repeatable and predictable becomes a physical choice. Uh, that's a specific uh, focus on culture. And then I think the final one for me, if I can just show you my last slide. Okay. Okay. So for me, it's a VUCA world out yet there. It's, it's volatile, it's unpredictable, it's complex and it's ambiguous. It will always surprise you. Things will always happen that you didn't predict. So, so business, a business and leaders need to, to be able to identify where their risks are and put mitigation in place so that when things happen, you know, when a, a pandemic occurs or a, you know, you suddenly you lose your source of supplier or material. You you already thought about it, and you already had an idea about what you were going to do. So I think people in organisations expect leaders to understand what's going on outside. They need to be connected with their supply chains or their suppliers or their customers. They need to be able to know what's going on, and they need to have plans in place. So. When you are going through any kind of change, I think Catherine used the example perfectly, you know, your people need to be able to trust that you know what you're doing. They need to be confident in your plans, but they also need to be, you know, they need to accept that things do go wrong. And if you share that with them, if you share with them the fact that there are things that are unpredictable and we don't quite know exactly what we're going to do, but, you know, we will have a plan, we will resolve it, we will be able to turn things around, you know, and if you identify, if you look at the graph there, the, the little chart, you need to identify all the things in the red box and have plans to move them towards the green box. So recognize where your vulnerabilities are and have plans in place should those things occur. And for me, risk is simply about either reducing the impact of a, a, a change when it comes or reducing the, the likelihood of that change happening. So that's me. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Thanks, Dennis. A really great insight into actually this slide uh, sums up what we're going through now. We we seem to have stumbled through um, uh, COVID, um, which came up and, and bit us unexpectedly, and then stumbled into a, a, a process where a war has, has occurred in in Eastern Europe. And the impact of that is, is changed and developed government policy. So all of these things are happening constantly, as you say, and the, 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 the factors um, and impact for organisations and the leaders within them, therefore, feel unpredictable. Uh, but actually, if we can try and plan for the unexpected and put in place these types of programmes, then it's something that, that makes us far more robust and give us much more of a solid foundation to survive and take those opportunities I spoke about earlier to the next level. Because when we come out the other side, if we've done this and we've managed to get through that, those learnings that we've developed will uh, play a, a, a great part in our future development and our future focus and, and gets us prepared for the next set. Because um, as we've mentioned already, something else will come along that will throw us off beam. So if we have uh, plans and processes in place to enable us to, to move that forward in a positive way, then we will survive and thrive. So, yeah, really interesting uh, content. Can I take us back a couple of steps, if you don't mind, uh, Dennis? And I want to sort of focus a little bit on performance and culture here and um, bring into play the idea of communications 
Uh, we touched on it very early on in the presentation, and I want to uh, draw Catherine in again to talk about how um, we can create a really solid foundation through excellent communications. One in particular that I want to pick out to begin with uh, and lead into that you touched on, Dennis, was around performance and having the right data and the right KPIs and avoiding confusion. So making sure that everybody is on the same page as far as that performance and that direction of travel is concerned, that's really critical uh, from, from the point of view of, of uh, knowing that you've succeeded um, in that change programme. So Kathleen, talk to me, if you don't mind, about uh, the approaches you take around communicating with your people, your teams, your leadership, um, and making sure everyone, again, is on the same page. Um, yes, so we uh, operate quite a, a cycle, I suppose, of communication that, that follows a, a routine. So in fact, later today, and it is quite difficult in these times, setting out an annual vision so that everyone in the organisation will join us to hear what we currently believe next year will look like. But I think that because then we go through a cycle of every 90 days, monitoring the KPIs that or setting the KPIs for the next cycle, reviewing what's just happened over the, the previous 90 days. Um, I think what, what we've definitely seen over the course of the last th three or four years is that it's really difficult to set a, a three to five year strategy, then have a one year plan and that still be the same every 90 days. So there's been a lot of uh, reactive um, approach to the, 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 the regular KPIs coming through. Um, and then everyone within the organisation, the intention is and we've done a lot of work on culture, people strategy, work we've done through the, the business growth hub as well to develop this where there should be a, 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 ideally a cascading down of the, uh, the annual plan to the 90 day cycle to individuals objectives of, of how they're contributing to that, what their purpose is within achieving those goals. Um, and, and then I think just because it feels like we're in times when communication has to be higher then it then it perhaps needs to be you can't communicate too much is the feeling that we get into then every single i mean it, it, during the pandemic it was every single day videos to the whole team that we've kind of scaled that back because everyone was sick of seeing my face on a video i think but um <laughs> weekly we'll have um you know usually it's just some nice nice news to make everyone feel part of that team but also updates on how we're performing against um the the, um, the the objectives that we set for that period and and it's it's really hard to to do it and to look back and say everything is because things appear within a quarter that you didn't think you'd have to deal with uh, as we've seen this year and I think that's that exactly like Dennis has said it's it's going to continue but I think to have those routines set where you'll keep reviewing it you don't have to stay as wedded to it and and think you can't deviate from it but it, it sets out that routine and I think that's been a great tool for us in the business to be able to all collectively come together to feel like we're um, able to to deliver the goals that are being set. Yeah fantastic. Dennis you were, you were going to uh, add something there I think? Yeah I just to build on what Catherine said what what she's described is absolutely absolutely the right thing to do you know you can over communicate you know you can't you you, you can't over communicate you can under communicate and the other thing just in, really importantly with to do with performance you know my success has been around focusing on positive energy so positively I think I don't find the things that positively drive you forward you know so many businesses focus on failure measurements. So, you know, we are successful because we've reduced the number of consumers we've disappointed, the number of complaints we've dealt with or whatever it may be. And if you focus on those things, then you, you drive an internally negative culture. So the, 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 the best way to drive positivity and energy is to focus on and measure successes. So we've had, yeah. you know, we had, you know, I don't know, our output was... 5% better this week than it was last week, as opposed to looking at failures, you know? And if you drive, if you look at every opportunity to identify the things that you do well, then people are, your team are always encouraged to do more things well than to, to try and avoid culpability for failure. Uh, and that unlocks all sorts of things 
And in my world, it used to help me to save lives in my in my factories across the world. Yeah, fa fascinating insight. Um, and and yes, communication, uh, I think is is front and center in change. Um, and I think the fact that we've um, brought that into play here is is really important for um, people to take away and think about in terms of the way they communicate with their people, with their teams, um, and with all their stakeholders. Again, change affects customers, it affects suppliers, and, and we want them to be actively involved in supporting us into that positive outcome because they share in our success. Um, so absolutely uh, a, a fantastic point to be made. Um, just a, a little bit of an addition from, from my perspective using this model here. And um, one of my um, previous uh, roles was, was similar in some respects to Dennis. I worked in some of the supply chain, actually supplying Dennis's organizations in the past. And one of the organizations I worked for uh, very much was in this proactive team zone around zero harm. And the reason we got there was touching on something Dennis has mentioned already. Um, we advised our supervisors, our supervision, our managers, uh, even my own behaviours were around going and looking at positive behaviours in the organisation, really celebrating when people did things right rather than going out because that actually drains your energy as a supervisor and a manager going out and looking for fault actually drains you as an individual going out and looking for success and patting people on the back and recognizing a job well done actually reinforces those great behaviors and pulls everyone away from the reactive to the proactive so if we see that in practice it actually can help and develop and change a culture so absolutely concur, really interesting points, and it's doable. Um, that's the most important takeaway. Um, if you really want to change the way your business and your people operate, really celebrate success, really recognize great behaviors, uh, which is something Jan touched on um, going through the train change transition curve, moving to the right hand side, that's the way forward. I have another question for you, Dennis, here. Uh, and it's around innovation. I always worry about um, when we are planning for something, an event that's, that's perhaps in our terms um, considered negative, does it stifle innovation? Do we not want to take risks? How do we mitigate the fact that we're planning for, almost planning for failure or difficulties? Will it prevent us from innovating and 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 making uh, and managing uh, the risks in the right way that gives a positive input for the, the organization have you got anything you would like to add uh, in answer to that question yeah of course i have you know you know having you know been responsible for risk management across a five billion dollar food business you know creativity is fundamental you know developing a new biscuit platform or cake platform developing new flavors and uh, using sourcing raw materials from places we've never sourced before. You know, all those things are real, they're dynamic. You get creative uh, uh, individuals who want to, you know, throw sesame seeds down a production line that's never seen sesame seeds before. You know, and it's the, instantly the, the, the fear is that you're going to create risk that uh, uh, you can't manage, but everything can be managed. Everything can be done. The answer is always yes. Let's look at how we can do it safely. So there is a very, very simple risk assessment model that I share with anybody who's interested. You know, it's just a simple question. So what do you want to change? What do you want to do? How do you want to evolve? Uh, and what could possibly go wrong? So you, you do you do the first of all, you do the first thing which says risk assess it. What could go wrong? Write all those things down. The second thing is, so if they did go wrong, so how do you stop them from going wrong? How do you remove, remember the risk model, you know, risk equals impact times likelihood. How do you, how do you prevent that from happening? What do you need to put in, in place to control it? And then the final thing, 
which everybody forgets in my experience, including major global businesses that I've watched, you know, struggle where my business hasn't, like the Mondelezes, the Crafts, the Heinzes, who've all had sesame seed or mycological issues that my business never had, you know, is the monitoring. So what do you look for in order to ensure that your control measure is in place? So identify what's going to go, go wrong. You know, I, if, you know, I could, I'll give you a really simple example. You know, I'm driving my car every day. In order that I'm safe in my car, I put my seatbelt on, okay? You don't look for the opportunity to have an accident. Every day you check to make sure everyone's got the seatbelt on. That's the, the monitor, you know, because if you don't, if you, if you recognize that the monitor is important, then you can control the, the event. So there is a simple risk assessment model that I can share with anyone that uh, manages any change whatsoever uh, and ensures that it's, as long as you follow the process, you know, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, fascinating. And again, I'm really pleased that we can um, re-establish that fact because um, actually what we want from our SMEs is the ability to innovate we want them to make changes we want them to actually be leading these changes um going forward um because um them as leaders and them their organization being agile and having the ability to move uh, at pace when they've got challenges in the external environment we don't want that to uh, hold them back we want them to actually take those risks uh, and actually innovate uh, for their future uh, and that of those organizations that rely on them um, going forward into the future. So, yes, absolutely uh, wonderfully put, Dennis. Thank you. And, Paul, you know, the other thing is, as Catherine said, you know, sometimes you need to change, you need to be agile to respond to an event. But also yeah. change is the adventure. You know, businesses mm. want to be excited. They want to be, uh, uh, they want to have a journey. They want to have an adventure to go on. How can you stifle adventure by my limiting change yeah it's the opportunity we spoke about right in the beginning Catherine I was just going to add to that um I think uh again not following the theoretical models which I've learned loads today I'll be I'll be doing that a bit more but where we would carry out say board level risk analysis that we started during the pandemic again to do separately an opportunity analysis because we were getting ourselves so dragged down by the weight of how there were some difficult things that we would have to take decisions on that we needed to deal with that we needed to plan for should they go wrong that you can just get yourself into a negativity spiral and so we did then start to work on a, 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 almost the reverse of that which is the opportunity analysis and, and almost following a similar kind of methodology i suppose again you would probably have a model for this dennis but you know looking at what the dependent factors are on that opportunity becoming realized and uh, what value it would add what the possibility chances are of it happening and uh, and go through those and it, it was funny how you felt that much more upbeat and positive when you went through that process yeah, fascinating. And, and, and thank you again uh, for that contribution. And it just brings me back round, really interestingly, back to right to the beginning to Jan and um, the way he couched the idea of the change curve with the three summations that he would expect the leaders to, to have in those environments. And they were showing up, taking charge, and having a sense of purpose. And Dennis, as you put um, quite succinctly that we should be doing these changes, we should be driving that opportunity. Then those three foundations that that's built on from a leadership perspective are really fundamental in making sure that that delivers success. So Jan, have you got anything just as we come to a close here of the session? to just add to what you've heard from Dennis's contribution in terms of culture change and managing the risks. Yeah, I think so. And it was really interesting uh, in both um, uh, Catherine's explanation of what happened and also to look at um, you know Dennis's approach to, to the cultural elements of these things. I think you know, for me, something that's fundamental to this is 
that the leaders ask themselves lots of the right questions early on soon. And one of the leading questions for me for business owners is being clear on what type of leader your business needs. I think that's a sort of fundamental element to this is, is really thinking about that. And that's a combination of understanding the styles of leadership that are the right approach for situations, as well as the methodologies that you use. Catherine mentioned, you know, not necessarily uh, letting yourself spiral into these situations just because you become overwhelmed with the number of activities that are going on. So I think it's, it's really important to, to be clear on certain things and I'd include in that making sure that you see obstacles as challenges rather than barriers. I think that's important that you get uh, a sense of being comfortable with discomfort, if you uh, understand that phrase, really. Um, learning to reflect, I think, is important. Being able to sort of take a step back um, and ask yourself the question, you know, how else could I approach this, that type of thing. Um, I think also we picked up on the, the importance of embracing continuous learning and development through some of the things that Dennis mentioned before. But I think ultimately, you know, my, my, my go away bit is, is be purpose driven, you know, at the end of the day. That's what, if we're going to be successful moving through these times, we've got to have a very clear focus and strategy on our destination and make sure that we're communicating um, with the rest of the team and they understand exactly what's taking place at any one time. Fantastic. And um, without uh, further ado, I'd like to bring this session uh, to a close. And, and um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, on behalf of the Growth Company and, and um, the people who uh, will join us today and hopefully pick up uh, this resource uh, through our web pages. Thank um, Dennis, Jan and Catherine for sharing uh, some models. Uh, more importantly, sharing their personal experience on the journey and uh, for their insights and multiple takeaways today. I, I know how I've taken away lots of tips and techniques that I can use in my own personal life um, and uh, obviously to help the businesses that I support uh, in the people, skills and talent team. And um, just to remind everyone, you can... Um, pick up um, a copy of this webinar uh, by visiting our website. The link is embedded in the slide deck, which will be shared by all people who've been registered to today's program. And uh, do join us. We are running these events weekly. Uh, we have another three uh, following on behind. The next one is Tuesday the 15th and builds on what we've done today. It's around developing your skills in the changing world. So we've uh, created the end to that uh, particular session. So do join us again next week. And um, thank you so much again, Dennis, Jan and Catherine uh, for your support and your input today. Much appreciated. Thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Bye for now. Thanks, Thanks. bye.